Book 6 of Lives of the Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius. This translation was published in the Loeb Classical Library, 1925. Book 6, Chapter 1. Antisthenes. Antisthenes, the son of Antisthenes, was an Athenian. It was said, however, that he was not of pure Attic blood, hence his reply to one who taunted him with this, the mother of the gods, too, is a Phrygian. For his mother was supposed to have been a Thracian. Hence it was that when he had distinguished himself in the Battle of Tanagra, he gave Socrates occasion to remark that, if be his parents had been Athenians, he would not have turned out so brave. He himself showed his contempt for the errors which the Athenians gave themselves on the strength of being sprung from the soil, by the remark that this did not make them any better than being born snails or wingless locusts. To begin with, he became a pupil of Gorgias, the rhetorician, and hence the rhetorical style that he introduces in his dialogues, and especially in his truth and in his exhortations. According to Hermippus, he intended at the public gathering for the Isthmian Games to discourse on the faults and merits of the Athenians, Thebans, and Lacedaemonians, but begged to be excused when he saw throngs arriving from those cities. Later on, however, he came into touch with Socrates, and derived so much benefit from him that he used to advise his own disciples to become fellow pupils with him of Socrates. He lived in the Piraeus, and every day would tramp the five miles to Athens in order to hear Socrates. From Socrates he learned his hardihood, emulating his disregard of feeling, and thus he inaugurated the cynic way of life. He demonstrated that pain is a good thing by instancing the great Heracles and Cyrus, drawing the one example from the Greek world and the other from the barbarians. He was the first to define statement, or assertion, by saying that a statement is that which sets forth what a thing was or is. He used repeatedly to say, I'd rather be mad than feel pleasure, and, we ought to make love to such a woman as will feel a proper gratitude. When a lad from Pontus was about to attend his lectures and asked him what he required, the answer was, come with a new book, a new pen, and new tablets, if you have a mind to implying the need of brains as well. When someone inquired what sort of wife he ought to marry, he said, If she's beautiful, you'll not have her to yourself. If she's ugly, you'll pay for it dearly. Being told that Plato was abusing him, he remarked, It is a royal privilege to do good and be ill-spoken of. When he was being initiated into the Orphic Mysteries, the priest said that those admitted into these rites would be partakers of many good things in Hades. Why then, said he, don't you die? Being reproached because his parents were not both freeborn, Nor are they both wrestlers, quoth he, but yet I am a wrestler. To the question why he had but few disciples, he replied, Because I use a silver rod to eject them. When he was asked why he was so bitter in reproving his pupils, he replied, Physicians are just the same with their patients. And upon seeing an adulterer running for his life, he exclaimed, Poor wretch, what peril you might have escaped at the price of an obol. He used to say, as we learn from Hecato in his anecdotes, that it is better to fall in with crows than with flatterers, for in the one case you are devoured when dead, in the other case, while alive. Being asked what was the height of human bliss, he replied, To die happy. When a friend complained to him that he had lost his notes, You should have inscribed them, said he on your mind instead of on paper. As iron is eaten away by rust, so, said he, the envious are consumed by their own passion. Those who would fain be immortal must, he declared, live piously and justly. States, said he, are doomed when they are unable to distinguish good men from bad. Once, when he was applauded by rascals, he remarked, I am horribly afraid I have done something wrong. When brothers agree, no fortress is so strong as their common life, he said. The right outfit for a voyage, he said, is such as, even if you are shipwrecked, will go through the water with you. One day he was censured for keeping company with evil men. The reply he made was, well, physicians are in attendance on their patients without getting the fever themselves. It is strange, said he, that we weed out the darnel from the corn, and the unfit in war do not excuse evil men from the service of the state. When he was asked what advantage had accrued to him from philosophy, his answer was, the ability to hold converse with myself. 
Someone, having called upon him over the wine for a song, he replied, Then you must accompany me on the pipe. When Diogenes begged a coat of him, he bade him fold his cloak around him double. Being asked what learning is the most necessary, he replied, How to get rid of having anything to unlearn. And when he advised that when men are slandered, they should endure it more courageously than if they were pelted with stones. And he used to taunt Plato with being conceited. At all events, when in a procession he spied a spirited charger, he said, turning to Plato, It seems to me that you would have made just such a proud, showy steed. This because Plato was constantly praising horse flesh. And one day he visited Plato, who was ill, and seeing the basin into which Plato had vomited, remarked, The bile I see, but not the pride. He used to recommend the Athenians to vote that asses are horses. When they deemed this absurd, his reply was, But yet generals are found among you who had no training, but were merely elected. Many men praise you, said one. Why, what wrong have I done, was his rejoinder. When he turned a torn part of his cloak so that it came into view, Socrates no sooner saw this than he said, I spy your love of fame peeping through your cloak. Phanius, in his work on the Socratics, tells us how someone asked him what he must do to be good and noble. And he replied, You must learn from those who know that the faults you have are to be avoided. When someone extolled luxury, his reply was, May the sons of your enemies live in luxury. To the youth who was posing fantastically as an artist's model, he put this question. Tell me if the bronze could speak on what, think you, would it pride itself the most on? On its beauty, was the reply. Then, said he, are you not ashamed of delighting in the very same quality as an inanimate object? When a young man from Pontus promised to treat him with great consideration, as soon as his boat with its freight of salt fish should arrive, he took him and an empty wallet to a flower dealer's, got it filled, and was going away. When the woman asked for the money, The young man will pay, said he, when his boatload of salt fish arrives. Antisthenes is held responsible for the exile of Anitus and the execution of Miletus, for he fell in with some youth from Pontus whom the fame of Socrates had brought to Athens, and he led them off to Anitus, whom he ironically declared to be wiser than Socrates. Whereupon, it is said, those about him with much indignation drove Anitus out of the city. If he saw a woman anywhere, decked out with ornaments, he would hasten to her house and bid her husband bring out his horse and arms, and then, if the man possessed them, let his extravagance alone, for he said, the man could with these defend himself, but if he had none, he would bid him strip off the finery. Favorite themes with him were the following. He would prove that virtue can be taught, that nobility belongs to none other than the virtuous, and he held virtue to be sufficient in itself to ensure happiness, since it needed nothing else except the strength of a Socrates. And he maintained that virtue is an affair of deeds, and does not need a store of words or learning. That the wise man is self-sufficing, for all the goods of others are his. That ill repute is a good thing, and much the same as pain. That the wise man will be guided in his public acts, not by the established laws, but by the law of virtue. That he will also marry, in order to have children, from union with the handsomest women. Furthermore, that he will not disdain to love, for only the wise man knows who are worthy to be loved. Diocles records the following sayings of his. To the wise man, nothing is foreign or impracticable. A good man deserves to be loved. Men of worth are friends. Make allies of men who are at once brave and just. Virtue is a weapon that cannot be taken away. It is better to be with a handful of good men fighting against all the bad than with hosts of bad men against a handful of good men. Pay attention to your enemies for they are the first to discover your mistakes. Esteem an honest man above a kinsman. Virtue is the same for women as for men. Good actions are fair, and evil actions foul. Count all wickedness foreign and alien. Wisdom is a most sure stronghold which never crumbles away nor is betrayed. Walls of defense must be constructed in our own impregnable reasonings. He used to converse in the gymnasium of Sinosarges, at no great distance from the gates, and some think that the Cynic school derived its name from Sinosarges. Antisthenes himself, too, was nicknamed a hound pure and simple, and he was the first, Diocles tells us, 
to double his cloak and be content with that one garment and to take up a staff and a wallet. Neantes, too, asserts that he was the first to double his mantle. So Socrates, however, in the third book of his Successions of Philosophers, says this was first done by Diodorus of Aspendus, who also let his beard grow and use a staff and a wallet. Of all the Socratics, Antisthenes alone is praised by Theompopus, who says that he had consummate skill and could by means of agreeable discourse win over whomsoever he pleased. And this is clear from his writing and from Xenophon's banquet. It would seem that the most manly action of the Stoic school owed its origin to him. Hence, Athenaeus, the epigrammist, writes thus of them. Ye experts in Stoic story, ye who commit to sacred pages most excellent doctrines, that virtue alone is the good of the soul, for virtue alone saves a man's life in cities. But that muse, that is one of the daughters of memory, approves the pampering of the flesh, which other men have chosen for their aim. Antisthenes gave the impulse to the indifference of Diogenes, the continence of Crates, and the hardihood of Zeno, himself laying the foundation of their state. Xenophon calls him the most agreeable of men in conversation, and the most temperate in everything else. His writings are preserved in ten volumes. The first includes A Treatise on Expression, or Styles of Speaking, Ajax, or The Speech of Ajax, Odysseus, or Concerning Odysseus, a Defense of Orestes, or Concerning Forensic Writers, Isography, or Lysias and Isocrates, A Reply to the Speech of Isocrates, entitled Without Witnesses. Volume 2 includes Of the Nature of Animals, Of Procreation of Children, or Of Marriage, A Discourse on Love, Of the Sophists, A Work on Physiognomy, On Justice and Courage, A Hortative Work in Three Books, Concerning Theognis, making a fourth and a fifth book. In the third volume are treatises of the good, of courage, of law, or of a commonwealth, of freedom and slavery, of belief, of the guardian, or on obedience, of victory, and economic work. In the fourth volume are included Cyrus, the great Heracles, or of strength. The fifth contains Cyrus, or of sovereignty. The sixth, Truth, of discussion, a handbook of debate. Sappho, or of contradiction, in three books. On talk. The seventh volume contains the following. On education, or on names, in five books. On the use of names, a controversial work. Of questioning and answering, of opinion and knowledge, in four books. Of dying, of life and death, of those in the underworld. Of nature, in two books. A problem concerning nature, two books, Opinions, or The Controversialist, Problems About Learning. In the eighth volume are On Music, On Commentators, On Homer, On Wickedness and Impiety, On Caucus, On the Scout, On Pleasure. The ninth volume contains Of the Odyssey, Of the Minstrel Staff, Athena, or Of Telemachus, Of Helen and Penelope, Of Proteus, Cyclops, or of Odysseus, of the use of wine, or of intoxication, or of the Cyclops, of Circe, of Amphiaros, of Odysseus, Penelope, and the Dog. The contents of the tenth volume are Heracles, or Midas, Heracles, or of wisdom or strength, Cyrus, or the Beloved, Cyrus, or the Scouts, Menexenus, or on ruling, Alcibiades, Archelaus, or of kingship. This is the list of his writings. Timon finds fault with him for writing so much and calls him a prolific trifler. He died of disease just as Diogenes, who had come in, inquired of him, Have you need of a friend? Once too Diogenes, when he came to him, brought a dagger, and when Antisthenes cried out, Who will release me from these pains? replied, This, showing him the dagger. I said, quoth the other, From my pains not from life. It was thought that he showed some weakness in bearing his malady through love of life, and here are my verses upon him. Such was your nature, Antisthenes, that in your lifetime you were very bulldog to rend the heart with words, if not with teeth, yet you died with consumption. Maybe someone will say, what of that? We must anyhow have some guide to the world below. 
There have been three other men named Antisthenes, one a follower of Heraclitus, another a native of Ephesus, and the third of Rhodes, a historian. And whereas we have enumerated the pupils of Aristippus and of Phaedo, we will now append an account of the Cynics and Stoics who derive from Antisthenes, and let it be in the following order. End of Antisthenes Chapter 2. Diogenes Diogenes was a native of Sinope, son of Hecesius, a banker. Diocles relates that he went into exile because his father was entrusted with the money of the state and adulterated the coinage. But Eubulides in his book on Diogenes says that Diogenes himself did this and was forced to leave home along with his father. Moreover, Diogenes himself actually confesses in his Pordalus that he adulterated the coinage. Some say that having been appointed to superintend the workmen, he was persuaded by them, and that he went to Delphi, or to the Delian Oracle, in his own city, and inquired of Apollo whether he should do what he was urged to do. When the god gave him permission to alter the political currency, not understanding what this meant, he adulterated the state coinage, and when he was detected according to some, he was banished, while according to others, he voluntarily quitted the city for fear of consequences. One version is that his father entrusted him with the money and that he debased it, in consequence of which the father was imprisoned and died, while the son fled, came to Delphi, and inquired not whether he should falsify the coinage, but what he should do to gain the greatest reputation, and that then it was that he received the oracle. On reaching Athens, he fell in with Antisthenes, being repulsed by him because he never welcomed pupils, by sheer persistence Diogenes wore him out. Once, when he stretched out his staff against him, the pupil offered his head with the words, Strike, for you will find no wood hard enough to keep me away from you, so long as I think you've something to say. From that time forward he was his pupil, and exile as he was, set upon a simple life. Through watching a mouse running about, says Theophrastus in the Megarian Dialogue, not looking for a place to lie down in, not afraid of the dark, not seeking any of the things which are considered to be dainties, he discovered a means of adapting himself to circumstances. He was the first, say some, to fold his cloak, because he was obliged to sleep in it as well. And he carried a wallet to hold his victuals, and he used any place for any purpose, for breakfasting, sleeping, or conversing. And then he would say, pointing to the portico of Zeus and the hall of processions, that the Athenians had provided him with places to live in. He did not lean upon the staff until he grew infirm, but afterwards he would carry it everywhere, not indeed in the city, but when walking along the road with it, and with his wallet. So say Olympiodorus, once a magistrate at Athens, Polyuctus the orator, and Lysinus the son of Escrio. He had written to someone to try and procure a cottage for him. When this man was a long time about it, he took for his abode the tub in the Metroon, as he himself explains in his letters and in summer he used to roll it over hot sand, while in winter he used to embrace the statues covered with snow, using every means of inuring himself to hardship. He was great at pouring scorn on his contemporaries. The school of Euclides he called Bilius, and Plato's lectures, waste of time. The performances at the Dionysia, great peep shows for fools, and the demagogues, the mobs, lackeys. He was also to say that when he saw physicians, philosophers, and pilots at their work, he deemed man the most intelligent of all animals, but when he saw interpreters of dreams, and diviners, and those who attend to them, or those who were puffed up with conceit of wealth, he thought no animal more silly. He would continually say that for the conduct of life, we need right reason, or a halter. Observing Plato one day at a costly banquet taking olives, How is it, he said, that you, the philosopher who sailed to Sicily for the sake of these dishes, now, when they are before you, do not enjoy them? Nay, by the gods, Diogenes, replied Plato, there are also for the most part I lived upon olives and such like. Why then, said Diogenes, did you need to go to Syracuse? Was it that Attica at the time did not grow olives? But Favorinus in his miscellaneous histories attributes this to Aristippus. Again, another time he was eating dried figs when he encountered Plato and offered him a share of them. When Plato took them and ate them, he said, I said you might share them, not that you might eat them all up. And one day when Plato had invited to his house friends coming from Dionysius, Diogenes trampled upon his carpets and said, I trample upon Plato's vainglory. Plato's reply was, How much pride are you exposed to view, Diogenes, by seeming not to be proud? Others tells us that what Diogenes said was, I trample upon the pride of Plato, who retorted, 
Yes, Diogenes, with pride of another sort. Sotion, however, in his fourth book, makes a cynic address this remark to Plato himself. Diogenes once asked him for wine, and after that, also for some dried figs, and Plato sent him a whole jarful. Then the other said, If someone asks you how many two and two are, will you answer twenty? So it seems, you neither give as you are asked, nor answer as you are questioned. Thus he scoffed at him, as one who talked without end. Being asked where in Greece he saw good men, he replied, Good men nowhere, but good boys at Lacedaemon. When one day he was gravely discursing and nobody attended to him, he began whistling, and as people clustered about him, he reproached them with coming in all serious to hear nonsense, but slowly and contemptuously when the testimony was serious. He would say that men strive in digging and kicking to outdo one another, but no one strives to become a good man and true. And he would wonder that the grammarians should investigate the ills of Odysseus while they were ignorant of their own, or that the musicians should tune the strings of the lyre while leaving the dispositions of their own souls discordant, that the mathematicians should gaze at the sun and moon but overlook matters close at hand, that the orders should make a fuss about justice in their speeches but never practice it, or that the avaricious should cry out against money while inordinately fond of it. He used also to condemn those who praised honest men for being superior to money while themselves envying the very rich. He was moved to anger that men should sacrifice to the gods to ensure health and in the midst of sacrifice should feast to the detriment of health. He was astonished that when slaves saw their masters were gluttons, they did not steal some of the viands. He would praise those who were about to marry and refrained, those who intending to go on a voyage never set sail, those who thinking to engage in politics and do no such thing, those also proposing to rear a family and not doing so, and those who make ready to live with potentants, yet never come near them after all. He used to say, moreover, that we ought to stretch out our hands to our friends, with the fingers open and not closed. Menippus, in his Sale of Diogenes, tells us how, when he was captured and put up for sale, he was asked what he could do. He replied, Govern men. And he told the crier to give notice in case anybody wanted to purchase a master for himself. Having been forbidden to sit down, It makes no difference, said he, for in whatever position fishes lie, they still find purchasers. And he said he marveled that before we buy a jar or dish, we try whether it rings true, but if it is a man, are content merely to look at him. To Xeniades, who purchased him, he said, You must obey me, although I am a slave, for if a physician or a steersman were in slavery, he would be obeyed. Eubulus, in his book entitled The Sale of Diogenes, tells us that this was how he trained the sons of Xeniades, after their other studies, he taught them to ride, to shoot with the bow, to sling stones, and to hurl javelins. Later, when they reached the wrestling school, he would not permit the master to give them full athletic training, but only so much as to heighten their color and keep them in good condition. The boys used to get by heart many passages from poets, historians, and the writings of Diogenes himself, and he would practice them in every short cut to good memory. In the house, too, he taught them to wait upon themselves and to be content with plain fare and water to drink. He used to make them crop their hair close and to wear it unadorned, and to go lightly clad, barefoot, silent, and not looking about them in the streets. He would also take them out hunting. They, on their part, had a great regard for Diogenes and made requests of their parents for him. The same Eubulus relates that he grew old in the house of Xeniades, and when he died was buried by his sons. There, Xeniades once asked him how he wished to be buried, to which he replied, On my face. Why? inquired the other. Because, said he, after a little time down will be converted into up. This was because the Macedonians had now got the supremacy, that is, had risen high from a humble position. Someone took him into a magnificent house and warned him not to expectorate, whereupon having cleared his throat he discharged the phlegm into the man's face, being unable, he said, to find a meaner receptacle. Others fathered us upon Aristippus. One day he shouted out for men, and when people collected, hit out at them with a stick, saying, It was men I called for, not scoundrels. This is told by Hikado in the first book of his Anecdotes. Alexander is reported to have said, Had I not been Alexander, I should have liked to be Diogenes. The word disabled, anapiros, Diogenes held ought to be applied not to the deaf or blind, but those who have no wallet. Pira. 
One day he made his way with head half-shaven into a party of young revelers, as Metrocles relates in his anecdotes, and was roughly handled by them. Afterwards, he entered on a tablet the names of those who had struck him and went about with the tablet hung around his neck, till he had covered them with ridicule and brought universal blame and discredit upon them. He described himself as a hound of the sort, which all men praise, but no one, he added, of his admirers dared to go out hunting along with him. When someone boasted that at the Pythian Games that he had vanquished men, Diogenes replied, Nay, I defeat men, you defeat slaves. To those who said to him, You're an old man, take rest. What? he replied. If I were running in the stadium, ought I to slacken my pace when approaching the goal? Ought I not rather to put on speed? Having been invited to a dinner, he declared that he wouldn't go, for the last time he went, his host had not expressed proper gratitude. He would walk upon snow barefoot and do other things mentioned above. Not only so, he even attempted to eat meat raw, but could not manage to digest it. He once found Demosthenes the orator lunching at an inn, and, when he retired within, Diogenes said, All the more you will be inside the tavern. When some strangers expressed a wish to see Demosthenes, he stretched out his middle finger and said, There goes the demagogue of Athens. Someone dropped a loaf of bread and was ashamed to pick it up, whereupon Diogenes, wishing to read him a lesson, tied a rope to the neck of the wine jar and proceeded to drag it across the ceramicus. He used to say that he followed the example of the trainers of courses, for they too set the note a little high to ensure that the rest should hit the right note. Most people, he would say, are so nearly mad that a finger makes all the difference. For if you go along with your middle finger stretched out, someone will think you mad. But if it's the little finger, they will not think so. Very valuable things, said he, were bartered for things of no value, and vice versa. At all events, a statue fetches 3,000 drachmas, while a quart of barley flour is sold for two copper coins. To Zeniades who purchased him, he said, Come, see that you obey orders. When he quoted the line, Backward the streams flow to their founts. Diogenes asked, If you had been ill and had purchased a doctor, would you then, instead of obeying him, have said, Backward the streams flow to their founts? Someone wanted to study philosophy under him. Diogenes gave him a tunic to carry and told him to follow him, and when for shame the man threw it away and departed, some time after on meeting him again, he laughed and said, The friendship between you and me was broken by a tuni. The version given by Diocles, however, is as follows. Someone having said to him, Lay your commands upon us, Diogenes. He took him away and gave him a cheese to carry, which cost half a noble. The other declined, whereupon he remarked, the friendship between you and me is broken by a little cheese worth half a noble. One day observing a child drinking out of his hands, he cast away the cup from his wallet with the words, A child has beaten me in plainness of living. He also threw away his bowl when in like manner he saw a child with broken his plate, taking up his lentils with the hollow part of a morsel of bread. He used also to reason thus, All things belong to the gods. The wise are friends to the gods, and friends hold things in common. Therefore, all things belong to the wise. One day he saw a woman kneeling before the gods in an ungraceful attitude, and wishing to free her of superstition, according to Zolius of Perga, he came forward and said, Are you not afraid, my good woman, that a god may be standing behind you? For all things are full of his presence, and you may be put to shame. He dedicated to Asclepius a bruiser, who, whenever people fell on their faces, used to run up to them and bruise them. All the curses of tragedy, he used to say, had lighted upon him. At all events, he was a homeless exile to his country dead, a wanderer who begs his daily bread. But he claimed that to fortune, he could oppose courage, to convention, nature, to passion, reason. When he was sunning himself in the cranium, Alexander came and stood over him and said, Ask of me any boon you like, to which he replied, Stand out of my light. Someone had been reading aloud for a very long time, and when he was near the end of the roll, pointed to a space with no writing on it. Cheer up, my men, cried Diogenes. There is land in sight. To one who by argument had proved conclusively that he had horns, he said, touching his forehead, Well, I, for my part, don't see any. In like manner, when somebody declared that there is no such thing as motion, he got up and walked about. When someone was discursing on celestial phenomena, 
How many days, asked Diogenes, were you in coming from the sky? A eunuch of bad character had inscribed on his door the words, Let no evil enter. How then, he asked, is the master of the house to get in? When he had anointed his feet with unguent, he declared that from his head the unguent passed into the air, but from his feet into his nostrils. The Athenians urged him to become initiated and told him that in the other world those who have been initiated enjoy a special privilege. It would be ludicrous, quoth he, if Agisalaus and Epimonidas are to dwell in the mire, while certain folk of no account will live in the isles of the blessed because they have not been initiated. When mice crept up on the table, he addressed them thus. See, now even Diogenes keeps parasites. When Plato styled him a dog, Quite true, he said, for I come back again and again to those who have sold me. As he was leaving the public bath, someone inquired if many men were bathing. He said no, but to another who asked if there was a great crowd of bathers, he said yes. Plato had defined man as an animal, biped and featherless, and was applauded. Diogenes plucked a fowl and brought it into the lecture room with the words, Here is Plato's man. In consequence of which there was added to the definition, having broad nails. To one who asked what was the proper time for lunch, he said, If a rich man, when you will. If a poor man, when you can. At Megara he saw the sheep protected by leather jackets, while the children went bare. It's better, said he, to be a Megarian's ram than his son. To one who had brandished a beam at him and then cried, Look out! He replied, What, are you intending to strike me again? He used to call the demagogues the lackeys of the people, and the crowns awarded to them the efflorescence of fame. He lit a lamp in broad daylight and said, as he went about, I am looking for a man. One day he got a thorough drenching where he stood, and when the bystanders pitied him, Plato said, If they really pitied him, they should move away, alluding to his vanity. When someone hit him a blow with his fist, Heracles, said he, how come I forgot to put on a helmet when I walked out? Furthermore, when Medius assaulted him and went on to say, There are three thousand drachmas to your credit. The next day he took a pair of boxing gauntlets, gave him a thrashing and said, There are three thousand blows to your credit. When Lysias, the druggist, asked him if he believed in the gods, How can I help believing in them, said he, when I see a god-forsaken wretch like you? Others give this retort to Theodorus. Seeing some perform religious purification, he said, Unhappy man, don't you know that you can no more get rid of errors of conduct by sprinkling than you can of mistakes in grammar? He would rebuke men in general with regard to their prayers, declaring that they ask for those things which seem to them to be good, not for such as are truly good. As for those who were excited over their dreams, he would say that they cared nothing for what they did in their waking hours, but kept their curiosity for the visions called upon in their sleep. At Olympia, when the herald proclaimed the Oxippus to be victor over men, Diogenes protested, Nay, he is victorious over slaves, I over men. Still, he was loved by the Athenians. At all events, when a youngster broke up his tub, they gave the boy a flogging and presented Diogenes with another. Dionysus, the Stoic, said that after Chaeronea, he was seized and dragged off to Philip, and being asked who he was, replied, a spy upon your insatiable greed. For this he was admired and set free. Alexander, having on one occasion sent a letter to Antipater at Athens by a certain Athleos, Diogenes, who was present, said, Graceless son of the graceless sire, to graceless white by graceless squire. Perdiccas, having threatened to put him to death unless he came to him, That's nothing wonderful, quoth he, for a beetle or a tarantula could do the same. Instead of that, he would have expected the threat to be that Perdiccas would be quite happy to do without his company. He would often insist loudly that the gods have given to men the means of living easily, but this had been put out of sight, because we require honeyed cakes, unguents, and the like. Hence, to a man whose shoes were being put on by his servants, he said, You have not attained to full felicity, unless he wipes your nose as well, and that will come when you have lost the use of your hands. Once he saw the officials of a temple leading away someone who had stolen a bull belonging to the treasurers, and said, 
The great thieves are leading away the little thief. Noticing a lad one day throwing stones at a cross gibbet, Well done, he said. You will hit your mark. When some boys clustered around him and said, Take care he doesn't bite us, he answered, Never fear, boys, a dog does not eat beetroot. To one who was proud of wearing a lion's skin, his words were, Leave off dishonoring the habiliments of courage. When someone was extolling the good fortune of Callisthenes and saying what splendor he shared in the suite of Alexander, Not so, said Diogenes, but rather ill fortune, for he breakfasts and dines when Alexander thinks fit. Being short of money, he told his friends that he applied to them not for alms, but for repayment of his due. When behaving indecently in the marketplace, he wished it were as easy to relieve hunger by rubbing an empty stomach. Seeing a youth starting off to dine with satraps, he dragged him off, took him to his friends, and bade them keep strict watch over him. When a youth effeminately attired put a question to him, he declined to answer, unless he pulled up his robe and showed whether he was a man or woman. A youth was playing cottabos in the bath. Diogenes said to him, The better you play, the worse it is for you. At all times in a feast, certain people kept throwing all the bones to him as they would have done to a dog. Thereupon he played a dog's trick and drenched them. Rhetoricians and all who talked for reputation he used to call thrice human, meaning thereby thrice wretched. An ignorant rich man he used to call the sheep with the golden fleece. Seeing a notice on the house of a profligate, to be sold, he said, I knew well that after such a fighting you would have thrown up the owner. To a young man who complained of the number of people who annoyed him by their attentions, he said, Cease to hang out a sign of invitation. Of a public bath which was dirty, he said, When people have bathed there, where are they to go to get clean? There was a stout musician whom everybody depreciated, and Diogenes alone praised. When asked why, he said, Because being so big, he yet sings to his lute and does not turn brigand. The musician who was always deserted by his audience, he greeted with a Hail Chanticleer, and when asked why he so addressed him, replied, Because your song makes everybody get up. A young man was delivering a set speech when Diogenes, having filled the front folds of his dress with lupins, began to eat them, standing right opposite to him. Having thus drawn off the attention of the assemblage, he said he was greatly surprised that they should desert the orator to look at himself. A very superstitious person addressed him thus, With one blow I will break your head. And I, said Diogenes, by a sneeze from the left will make you tremble. Hegesius, having asked him to lend him one of his writings, he said, You are a simpleton, Hegesius. You do not choose painted figs, but real ones, and that you pass over the true training and would apply yourself to written rules. When someone reproached him with his exile, his reply was, Nay, it was through that, you miserable fellow, that I came to be a philosopher. Again, when someone reminded him that the people of Sinope had sentenced him to exile, and I them, said he, to homestaying. Once he saw an Olympic victor tending sheep, and thus accosted him, Too quickly, my good friend, have you left Olympia for Nemea. Being asked why athletes are so stupid, his answer was, Because they are built up of pork and beef. He once begged alms of a statue, and when asked why he did so, replied, To get practice in being refused. In asking alms, as he did at first by reason of his poverty, he used this form, If you have already given to anyone else, give to me also. If not, begin with me. On being asked by a tyrant what bronze is best for a statue, he replied, That of which Harmodius and Aristogiton were molded. Asked how Dionysius treated his friends, Like Persis, he replied. So long as they are full, he hangs them up, and when they are empty, he throws them away. Someone lately wet had set up on his door this notice. The son of Zeus, victorious Heracles, dwells here. Let nothing evil enter in. To which Diogenes added, After war, alliance. The love of money he declared to be the mother city of all evils. Seeing a spendthrift eating olives in a tavern, he said, If you had breakfasted in this fashion, you would not so be dining. Good men he called images of the gods, and loved the business of the idol. To the question what is wretched in life, he replied, An old man destitute. Being asked what creature's bite is the worst, he said, Of those that are wild, the sycophants. Of those that are tame, a flatterers. 
Upon seeing two centaurs very badly painted, he asked, Which of these is Chiron? Ingratiating speech he compared to honey used to choke you. The stomach he called livelihoods charybdis. Hearing a report that Didymon the flute player had been caught in adultery, his comment was, His name alone is sufficient to hang him. To the question why gold is pale, his reply was, Because it has so many thieves plotting against it. On seeing a woman carried in a litter, he remarked that the cage was not in keeping with the quarry. One day, seeing a runaway slave on the brink of a well, he said, Take care, my lad, you don't fall in. Seeing a boy taking clothes at the baths, he asked, Is it for a little unguent, Alimaton, or is it for a new cloak, Alimaton? Seeing some woman hanged from an olive tree, he said, Would that every tree bore similar fruit. On seeing a footpad, he accosted him thus, what makest thou here, my gallant? Comest thou perchance for plunder of the dead? Being asked whether he had any maid or boy to wait on him, he said no. If you should die then, who will carry you out to burial? Whoever wants the house, he replied. Noticing a good-looking youth lying in an exposed position, he nudged him and cried, Up, man, up, lest some foe thrust a dart into thy back. To one who was feasting lavishly, he said, Short-lived thou be, my son, by what thou buyest. As Plato was conversing about ideas and using the nouns tablehood and cuphood, he said, Table and cup I see, but your tablehood and cuphood, Plato, I can no why see. That's readily accounted for, said Plato, for you have the eyes to see the visible table and cup, but not the understanding by which ideal tablehood and cuphood are discerned. On being asked by somebody, what sort of man do you consider Diogenes to be? A Socrates gone mad, said he. Being asked what was the right time to marry, Diogenes replied, For a young man, not yet. For an old man, never at all. Being asked what he would take to be soundly cuffed, he replied, A helmet. Seeing a youth dressing with elaborate care, he said, If it's for men, you're a fool. If for a woman, a knave. One day he detected a youth blushing. Courage, quoth he, that is the hue of virtue. One day, after listening to a couple of lawyers disputing, he condemned them both, saying that the one had no doubt stolen, but the other had not lost anything. To the question what wine he found most pleasant to drink, he replied, that for which other people pay. When he was told that many people laughed at him, he made answer, But I am not laughed down. When someone declared that life is an evil, he corrected him, Not life itself, but living ill. When he was advised to go in pursuit of his runaway slave, he replied, It would be absurd if Manes can live without Diogenes, but Diogenes cannot get on without Manes. When breakfasting on olives amongst which a cake had been inserted, he flung it away and addressed it thus, Stranger, betake thee from the prince's path. And on another occasion, thus, he lashed an olive. Being asked what kind of hound he was, he replied, When hungry, a Maltese. When full, a Molossian. Two breeds which most people praise, though for fear of fatigue, they do not venture out hunting with them. So neither can you live with me, because you are afraid of the discomforts. Being asked if the wise eat cakes, yes, he said, cakes of all kinds, just like other men. Being asked why people give to beggars, but not to philosophers, he said, because they think they may one day be lame or blind, but never expect that they will turn to philosophy. He was begging of a miserly man who was slow to respond. So he said, my friend, it's for food that I'm asking, not for funeral expenses. Being reproached one day for having falsified the currency, he said, That was the time when I was such as you are now, but such as I am now, you will never be. To another who reproached him for the same offense, he made a more scurrilous repartee. On coming to Mindus and finding the gates large, though the city itself was very small, he cried, Men of Mindus, bar your gates lest the city should run away. Seeing a man who had been caught stealing purple, he said, Fast gripped by purple death and forceful fate. 
When Craterus wanted him to come and visit him, No, he replied, I would rather live on a few grains of salt at Athens than enjoy sumptuous fare at Craterus's table. He went up to Anaximenes, the rhetorician, who was fat, and said, Let us beggars have something of your paunch. It will be a relief to you, and we shall get advantage. And when the same man was discursing, Diogenes distracted his audience by producing some salt fish. This annoyed the lecturer, and Diogenes said, An obol's worth of salt fish has broken up Anaximenes' lecture class. Being reproached for eating in the marketplace, Well, it was in the marketplace, he said, that I felt hungry. Some authors affirm that the following also belongs to him, that Plato saw him washing lettuces, came up to him, and quietly said to him, Had you paid court to Dionysius, you would now be washing lettuces. And that he with equal calmness made answer, If you had washed lettuces, you wouldn't have paid court to Dionysius. When someone said, Most people laugh at you, his reply was, And so very likely do asses at them, but as they don't care for the asses, so neither do I for them. One day observing a youth studying philosophy, he said, Well done, philosophy, that thou divertest admirers of bodily charms to the real beauty of the soul. When someone expressed astonishment at the votive offerings in Samothrake, his comment was, There would have been far more if those were not saved had set up offerings. But others attribute this remark to Diagoras of Melos. To a handsome youth who was going out to dinner, he said, You will come back a worse man. When he came back and said next day, I went and am none the worse for it. Diogenes said, Not worse man but lax man. He was asking alms of a bad-tempered man, who said, Yes, if you can persuade me. If I could persuade you, said Diogenes, I would have persuaded you to hang yourself. He was returning from Lacedaemon to Athens, and on someone asking, Whither and whence? He replied, From the men's apartments to the women's. He was returning from Olympia, and when someone inquired whether there was a great crowd, Yes, he said, a great crowd but few who could be called men. Libertines he compared to fig trees growing upon a cliff, whose fruit is not enjoyed by any man, but is eaten by ravens and vultures. When Phryne set up a golden statue of Aphrodite in Delphi, Diogenes is said to have written upon it, from the licentiousness of Greece. Alexander once came and stood opposite him, and said, I am Alexander, the great king. And I, said he, am Diogenes the Cynic. Being asked what he had done to be called a hound, he said, I fawn on those who give me anything, I yelp at those who refuse, and I set my teeth in rascals. He was gathering figs and was told by the keeper that not long before a man had hanged himself on that very fig tree. Then, said he, I will now purge it. Seeing an Olympian victor casting repeated glances at a courtesan, See, he said, Yonder ram frenzied for battle, how he is held fast by the neck, fascinated by a common minx. Handsome courtesans he would compare to a deadly honeyed potion. He was breakfasting in the marketplace, and the bystanders gathered round him with cries of, Dog! It is you who are dogs, cried he, when you stand round and watch me at my breakfast. When two cowards hid away from him, he called out, Don't be afraid, a hound is not fond of beetroot. When asked where a young boy prostituting himself was from, he said, From Tegea. After seeing a stupid wrestler practicing as a doctor, he inquired of him, What does this mean? Is it that you may now have your revenge on the rivals who formerly beat you? Seeing the child of a courtesan throw stones at a crowd, he cried out, Take care you don't hit your father. A boy having shown him a dagger that he had received from an admirer, Diogenes remarked, a pretty blade with an ugly handle. When some people commended a person who had given him gratuity, he broke in with, You have no praise for me who was worthy to receive it. When someone asked that he might have back his cloak, If it was a gift, replied Diogenes, I possess it, while if it was a loan, I am using it. A supposititious son having told him that he had got gold in the pocket of his dress, True, said he, and therefore you sleep with it under your pillow. On being asked what he had gained from philosophy, he replied, 
this at least if nothing else, to be prepared for every fortune. As where he came from, he said, I am a citizen of the world. Certain parents were sacrificing to the gods that a son might be born to them. But, said he, do you not sacrifice to ensure what manner of man he shall turn out to be? When asked for a subscription towards a club, he said to the president, They spoil the rest. Off, Hector, keep thy hands. The mistresses of kings he designated queens, for, said he, they make the kings do their bidding. When the Athenians gave Alexander the title of Dionysus, he said, Me too, you might make Serapis. Someone having reproached him for going into dirty places, his reply was that the sun too visits cesspools without being defiled. When he was dining in a temple, and in the course of the meal loaves not free from dirt were put on the table, he took them up and threw them away, declaring that nothing unclean ought to enter a temple. To the man who said to him, You don't know anything, although you are a philosopher. He replied, Even if I am but a pretender to wisdom, that in itself is philosophy. When someone brought a child to him and declared him to be highly gifted and of excellent character, What need, then, said he, has he of me? Those who say admirable things but fail to do them he compared to a harp, for the harp, like them, he said, has neither hearing nor perception. He was going into a theater, meeting face to face those who were coming out, and being asked why, this, he said, is what I practice doing all my life. Seeing a young man behaving effeminately, Are you not ashamed, he said, that your own intention about yourself should be worse than nature's? For nature made you a man, but you are forcing yourself to play the woman. Observing a fool tuning a psaltery, Are you not ashamed, said he, to give this wood concordant sounds while you fail to harmonize your soul with life? To one who protested that he was ill-adapted for the study of philosophy, he said, Why then do you live if you do not care to live well? To one who despised his father, Are you not ashamed, he said, to pride yourself? Noticing a handsome youth chattering in unseemly fashion, Are you not ashamed, he said, to draw a dagger of lead from an ivory scabbard? Being reproached with drinking in a tavern, Well, said he, I also get my hair cut in a barber's shop. Being reproached with accepting a cloak from Antipater, he replied, The gods' choice gifts are no wise to be spurned. When someone first shook a beam at him and then shouted, Look out! Diogenes struck the man with his staff and added, Look out! To a man who was urgently pressing his suit to a courtesan, he said, Why, hapless man, are you at such pains to gain your suit, when it would be better for you to lose it? To one with perfumed hair, he said, Beware lest a sweet scent on your head cause an ill odor in your life. He said that bad men obeyed their lusts as servants obeyed their masters. The question being asked why footmen are so called, he replied, Because they have the feet of men, but souls such as you, my questioner, have. He asked a spendthrift for Amina. The man inquired why it was that he asked others for an obol, but for him, Amina. Because, said Diogenes, I expect to receive from others again, but whether I shall ever get anything from you again lies on the knees of the gods. Being reproached with begging when Plato did not beg, Oh yes, says he, he does. But when he does so, he holds his head down close that none may hear. Seeing a bad archer, he sat down beside the target with the words, in order not to get hit. Lovers, he declared, derive their pleasures from their misfortune. Being asked whether death was an evil thing, he replied, How can it be evil, when in its presence we are not aware of it? When Alexander stood opposite him and asked, Are you not afraid of me? Why, what are you? said he, a good thing or a bad thing? Upon Alexander replying, A good thing. Who then, said Diogenes, is afraid of the good? Education, according to him, is a controlling grace to the young, consolation to the old, wealth to the poor, and ornament to the rich. When Didymon, who was a rake, 
was once treating a girl's eye. Beware, says Diogenes, lest the oculist, instead of curing the eye, should ruin the pupil. On somebody declaring that his own friends were plotting against him, Diogenes exclaimed, What is to be done, then, if you have to treat friends and enemies alike? Being asked what was the most beautiful thing in the world, he replied, Freedom of speech. On entering a boy's school, he found there many statues of the muses, but few pupils. By the help of the gods, said he, Schoolmaster, you have plenty of pupils. It was his habit to do everything in public, the works of Demeter and Aphrodite alike. He used to draw out the following arguments. If to breakfast be not absurd, neither is it absurd in the marketplace. But to breakfast is not absurd, therefore it is not absurd to breakfast in the marketplace. Behaving indecently in public, he wished it were as easy to banish hunger by rubbing the belly. Many other sayings are attributed to him, which it would take long to enumerate. He used to affirm that training was of two kinds, mental and bodily, the latter being that whereby, with constant exercise, perceptions are formed such a secure freedom of movement for virtuous deeds, and the one half of this training is incomplete without the other, good health and strength being just as much included among the essential things, whether for body or soul. And he would adduce indisputable evidence to show how easily from gymnastic training we arrive at virtue, for in the manual crafts and other arts, it can be seen that the craftsmen develop extraordinary manual skill through practice. Again, take the case of flute players and of athletes. What surpassing skill they acquire by their own incessant toil, and if they had transferred their efforts to the training of the mind, how certainly their labors would not have been unprofitable or ineffective. Nothing in life, however, he maintained, has any chance of succeeding without strenuous practice, and this is capable of overcoming anything. Accordingly, instead of useless toils, men should choose such as nature recommends, whereby they might have lived happily. Yet such is their madness that they choose to be miserable, for even the despising of pleasure is itself most pleasurable when we are habituated to it. And just as those accustomed to a life of pleasure feel disgust when they pass over to the opposite experience, so those whose training has been of the opposite kind derive more pleasure from despising pleasure than from the pleasure themselves. This was the gist of his conversation, and it was plain that he acted accordingly, adulterating currency in very truth, allowing convention no such authority as he allowed to natural right, and asserting that the manner of life he lived was the same as that of Heracles when he preferred liberty to everything. He maintained that all things are the property of the wise, and employed such arguments as those cited above. All things belong to the gods, the gods are friends to the wise, and friends share all property in common. Therefore, all things are the property of the wise. Again, as to law, that it is impossible for society to exist without law, for without a city no benefit can be derived from that which is civilized. But the city is civilized, and there is no advantage in law without a city. Therefore, law is something civilized. He would ridicule good birth and fame and all such distinctions, calling them showy ornaments of vice. The only true commonwealth was, he said, that which is as wide as the universe. He advocated community of wives, recognizing no other marriage than a union of the man who persuades with the woman who consents. And for this reason, he taught sons, too, should be held in common. And he saw no impropriety, either in stealing anything from a temple or in eating the flesh of any animal, nor even anything impious in touching human flesh. This, he said, being clear from the custom of some foreign nations. Moreover, according to the right reason, as he put it, all elements are contained in all things and pervade everything, since not only is meat a constituent of bread, but bread of vegetables, and all other busy also, by means of certain invisible passages and particles, find their way in and unite with all substances in the form of vapor. This he makes plain in the Thyestes, if the tragedies are really his and not the work of his friend Philiscus of Aegina, or of Pasiphon, the son of Lucian, who, according to Favorinus and his miscellaneous history, wrote them after the death of Diogenes. He held that we should neglect music, geometry, astronomy, and the like studies as useless and unnecessary. He became very ready also at repartee in verbal debates, 
as was evident from what he had said above. Further, when he was sold as a slave, he endured it most nobly, for on a voyage to Aegina he was captured by pirates under the command of Scirpalus, conveyed to Crete and exposed for sale. When the auctioneer asked in what he was proficient, he replied, In ruling men. Thereupon he pointed to a certain Corinthian, with a fine purple border to his robe, the man named Xeniades, above mentioned, and said, Sell me to this man, he needs a master. Thus Xeniades came to buy him, and took him to Corinth, and set him over his own children, and entrusted his whole household to him. And he administered it in all respects, in such a manner that Xeniades used to go about saying, A good genius has entered my house. Cleomenes, in his work Concerning Pedagogues, says that the friends of Diogenes wanted to ransom him, whereupon he called them simpletons. For, said he, lions are not the slaves of those who feed them, but rather those who feed them are at the mercy of the lions. For fear is the mark of the slave, whereas the wild beasts make men afraid of them. The man had in fact a wonderful gift of persuasion, so that he could easily vanquish anyone he liked in argument. At all events, a certain Onesicritus of Aegina is said to have sent to Athens the one of his two sons named Androsthenes, and he, having become a pupil of Diogenes, stayed there. The father then sent the other also, the aforesaid Philiscus, who was the elder, in search of him. But Philiscus also was detained in the same way. When thirdly the father himself arrived, he was just as much attracted to the pursuit of philosophy as his sons and joined the circle. So magical was the spell which the discourses of Diogenes exerted. Among his hearers was Phocion, surnamed the Honest, and Stilpo the Megarian, and many other men prominent in political life. Diogenes is said to have been nearly ninety years old when he died. Regarding his death there are several different accounts. One is that he was seized with colic after eating an octopus raw, and so met his end. Another is that he died voluntarily by holding his breath. This account was followed by Kirkidas of Megalopolis, or of Crete, who in his Meliambics writes thus, Not so who after time was a citizen of Sinope, that famous one who carried a staff, doubled his cloak, and lived in the open air, but he soared aloft with his lip tightly pressed against his teeth, and holding his breath withal, for in truth he was rightly named Diogenes, a true-born son of Zeus, a hound of heaven. Another version is that while trying to divide an octopus amongst the dogs, he was so severely bitten on the sinew of the foot that it caused his death. His friends, however, according to Antisthenes and his successions of philosophers, conjectured that it was due to the retention of his breath. For he happened to be living in the cranium, the gymnasium in front of Corinth, when his friends came according to custom and found him wrapped up in his cloak. Then, thought he must be asleep, although he was by no means of drowsy or somnolent habit, they therefore drew aside his cloak and found that he was dead. This they supposed to have been his deliberate act in order to escape thenceforward from life. Hence, it is said, arose a quarrel among his disciples as to who should bury him. Nay, they even came to blows. But, when their fathers and men of influence arrived, under their direction he was buried beside the gate leading to the Isthmus. Over his grave they set up a pillar and a dog in Parian marble upon it. Subsequently, his fellow citizens honored him with bronze statues, on which these verses were inscribed. Time makes even bronze grow old, but thy glory, Diogenes, all eternity will never destroy, since thou alone didst point out to mortals the lesson of self-sufficingness and the easiest path of life. We too have written on him in the Prochelismatic meter. A. Diogenes, come tell me what fate took you to the world below. B. A dog's savage tooth. But some say that when dying he left instructions that they should throw him out unburied, that every wild beast might feed on him, or thrust him into a ditch and sprinkle a little dust over him. But according to others, his instructions were that they should throw him into the Ilysses, in order that he might be useful to his brethren. Demetrius in his work on men of the same name asserts that on the same day on which Alexander died in Babylon, Diogenes died in Corinth. He was an old man in the 113th Olympiad. The following writings attributed to him. Dialogues. Cephalion. Ictaeus. Jackdaw. Pordalus. The Athenian Demos. Republic. Art of Ethics. On Wealth. On Love. Theodorus. Hypsius. Aristarchus. On Death. 
letters. Seven tragedies. Helen, Thyestes, Heracles, Achilles, Medea, Chrysippus, Oedipus. Sosicrates in the first book of his Successions and Satyrus in the fourth book of his Lives alleged that Diogenes left nothing in writing, and Satyrus adds that the sorry tragedies are by his friend Philiscus, the Aigenetan. Sotion, in his seventh book, declares that only the following are genuine works of Diogenes. On Virtue, On Good, On Love, A Medicant, Ptolemaeus, Pordalus, Cassandrus, Cephalion, Philiscus, Aristarchus, Sisyphus, Ganymedes, Anecdotes, Letters. There have been five men who were named Diogenes, the first of Apollonia, a natural philosopher. The beginning of his treatise runs thus. At the outset of every discourse, methinks one should see to it that the basis laid down is unquestionable. The second, of Sicyon, who wrote an account of Peloponnesus. The third, our present subject. The fourth, a Stoic, born at Seleucia, who is also called the Babylonian, because Seleucia is near Babylon. The fifth, of Tarsus an author of a work on poetical problems, which he attempts to solve. Now, the philosopher is said by Athenodorus in the eighth book of his walks to have always had a sleek appearance owing to the use of unguents. End of Diogenes Chapter 3 Monimus Monimus of Syracuse was a pupil of Diogenes, and, according to Sosicrates, he was in the service of a certain Corinthian banker, to whom Xeniades, the purchaser of Diogenes, made frequent visits, and by the account which he gave of his goodness in word and deed, excited in Monimus a passionate admiration of Diogenes, for he forthwith pretended to be mad and proceeded to fling away the small change and all the money on the banker's table, until at length his master dismissed him, and then he straightway devoted himself to Diogenes. He often followed Crates the cynic as well, and embraced the like pursuits, whereupon his master, seeing him do this, was all the more persuaded that he was mad. He came to be a distinguished man, so much so that he is even mentioned by the comic poet Menander. At any rate, in one of his plays, The Groom, his words are, One monomist there was, a wise man, Philo, but not so very famous. He, you mean, who carried the scrip? Nay, not one scrip, but three. Yet never a word, so help me Zeus, spake he to match the saying, Know thyself, nor such famed watchwords. Far beyond all these he went, your dusty medicant, pronouncing wholly vain all man's supposings. Monimus indeed showed himself a very grave moralist, so that he ever despised mere opinion and sought only truth. He has left us, besides some trifles blended with covert earnestness, two books, On Impulses and An Exhortation to Philosophy. End of Monimus Chapter 4 Onesicritus Onesicritus some report to have been an Agonitan, but Demetrius of Magnesia says that he was a native of Astapalia, he too was one of the distinguished pupils of Diogenes. His career seems to have resembled that of Xenophon, for Xenophon joined the expedition of Cyrus, Onesicritus, that of Alexander, and the former wrote the Cyropedia, or Education of Cyrus, while the latter has described how Alexander was educated. The one, a laudation of Cyrus, the other, of Alexander. And in their diction they are not unlike, except that Onesicritus, as to be expected in an imitator, falls short of his model. Amongst other pupils of Diogenes were Menander, who was nicknamed Drymus or Oakwood, a great admirer of Homer, Hegesius of Sinope, nicknamed Dog Collar, and Philiscus of Aegina mentioned above. End of Onesicritus Chapter 5 Crates Crates, the son of Ascondus, was a Theban, he, too, was amongst the cynic's famous pupils. Hippopotus, however, alleges that he was a pupil not of Diogenes, but of Bryson, the Achaean. The following playful lines are attributed to him. There is a city, Para, in the midst of wine-dark vapor, fair, fruitful, 
passing squalid, owning not into which sails nor fool nor parasite, nor glutton, slave of sensual appetite, but time it bears, garlic and figs and loaves, for which things sake men fight not with each other, nor stand to arms for money or for fame. There is also his widely circulated day book, which runs as follows. Set down for the chef ten minus, for the doctor one drachma, for a flatterer talents five, for a council spoke, for mercenary beauty a talent, for a phrase three obols. He was known as the door opener, the caller to whom all doors fly open, from his habit of entering every house and admonishing those within. Here is another specimen of his composition. That much I have which I have learnt and thought, the noble lessons taught me by the muses, but wealth amassed is prey to vanity. And again he says that what he has gained from philosophy is a court of lupins and to care for no one. This too is quoted as his. Hunger stops love, or if not hunger, time, or, failing both these means of help, a halter. He flourished in the 113th Olympiad. According to Antisthenes and his successions, the first impulse to cynic philosophy was given to him when he saw Telephus in a certain tragedy carrying a little basket and altogether in a wretched plight. So he turned his property into money, for he belonged to a distinguished family, and having thus collected about 200 talents, distributed that sum among his fellow citizens. And, it is added, so sturdy a philosopher did he become, that he is mentioned by the comic poet Philemon, at all events, the latter says, In summertime a thick cloak he would wear, to be like Crates, and in winter rags. Diocles relates how Diogenes persuaded Crates to give up his fields to sheep pasture and throw into the sea all the money he had. In the home of Crates, Alexander is said to have lodged, as Philip once lived in Hipparchias. Often, too, certain of his kinsmen would come to visit him and try to divert him from his purpose. These he would drive from him with his stick, and his resolution was unshaken. Demetrius of Magnesia tells a story that he entrusted a banker with a sum of money on condition that if his sons proved ordinary men, he was to pay it to them, but if they became philosophers, then to distribute it among the people, for his sons would need nothing if they took to philosophy. Eratosthenes tells us that by Hipparchia, of whom we shall presently speak, he had a son born to him named Pasicles, and after he had ceased to be a cadet on service, Crates took him to a brothel and told him that was how his father had married. The marriage of intrigue and adultery, he said, belonged to tragedy, having exile or assassination as its rewards, while the weddings of those who take up courtesans are material for comedy, for as a result of extravagance and drunkenness, they bring about madness. This man had a brother named Pasicles, who was a disciple of Euclides. Favorinus in the second book of his memorabilia tells a pleasant story of Crates, for he relates how when making some request of the master of the gymnasium, he laid hold on his hips, and when he demurred, said, What? Are not these hip joints yours as much as your knees? It was, he used to say, impossible to find anybody wholly free from flaws, but just as in a pomegranate, one of the seeds is always going bad. Having exasperated the musician Nicodromus, he was struck by him on the face. So he stuck a plaster on his forehead with these words on it, Nicodromus's handiwork. He carried on a regular campaign of invective against the courtesans, habituating himself to meet their abuse. When the Metris of Phalerum sent him loaves of bread and some wine, he reproached him, saying, Oh, that the springs yielded bread as well as water. It is clear, then, that he was a water drinker. When the police inspectors found fault with him for wearing muslin, his answer was, I'll show you that Theophrastus also wears muslin. This they would not believe, so he led them to a barber's shop and showed them Theophrastus being shaved. At Thebes he was flogged by the master of the gymnasium, another version being that it was by Euthycrates and at Corinth, and being dragged by the heels he called out, as if it did not affect him, seized by the foot and dragged over heaven's high threshold. Diocles, however, says that it was by Menedemus of Eritrea that he was thus dragged, for he, being handsome and being thought to be intimate with Asclepides, the Phliasian, Crates slapped him on the side with a brutal taunt, whereupon Menedemus, full of indignation, dragged him along, and he declaimed as above. Zeno of Kidium in his anecdotes relates that in a fit of heedlessness he sued a sheepskin to his cloak. 
he was ugly to look at, and when performing his gymnastic exercises used to be laughed at. He was accepted to say, raising his hands, Take heart, Crates, for it is for the good of your eyes and of the rest of your body. You will see these men who are laughing at you, tortured before long by disease, counting you happy and reproaching themselves for their sluggishness. He used to say that we should study philosophy to the point of seeing in generals nothing but donkey drivers. Those who live with flatterers he declared to be as defenseless as calves in the midst of wolves, for neither these nor those have any to protect them, but only such as plot against them. Perceiving that he was dying, he would chant over himself this charm. You are going, dear hunchback. You are off to the house of Hades, bent crooked by old age. For his years had bowed him down. When Alexander inquired whether he would like his native city to be rebuilt, his answer was, Why should it be? Perhaps another Alexander will destroy it again. Ignominy and poverty he declared to be his country, which fortune could never take captive. He was, he said, a fellow citizen of Diogenes, who defiled all the plots of envy. Menander alludes to him in the twin sisters in the following lines. Wearing a cloak, you'll go about with me, as once with Sinecrates went his wife, his daughter too, as he himself declared, he gave in marriage for a month on trial. We come now to his pupils. End of Crates Chapter 6. Metrocles Metrocles of Maronea was the brother of Hipparchia. He had been formerly a pupil of Theophrastus the Peripatetic, and had been so far corrupted by weakness that, when he made a breach of good manners in the course of rehearsing a speech, it drove him to despair, and he shut himself up at home intending to starve himself to death. On learning this, Crates came to visit him, as he had been asked to do, and after advisingly making a meal of lupins, he tried to persuade him by argument as well that he had committed no crime for a prodigy would have happened if he had not taken the natural means of relieving himself. At last, by reproducing the action, he succeeded in lifting him from his dejection, using for his consolation the likeness of the occurrences. From that time forward, Metrocles was his pupil, and became proficient in philosophy. Hecato, in the first book of his Anecdotes, tells us he burnt his composition with the words, Phantoms are these of dreams of the world below. Others say that when he set fire to his notes of Theophrastus' lectures, he added the line, Come hither, Hephaestus, Thetis now needeth thee. He divided things into such as are procurable for money, like a house, and such as can be procured by time and trouble, like education. Wealth, he said, is harmful, unless we put it to a worthy use. He died of old age, having choked himself. His disciples were Theombrotus and Cleomenes. Theombrotus had for his pupil Demetrius of Alexandria, while Cleomenes instructed Timarchus of Alexandria and Echecles of Ephesus. Not but what Echecles also heard Theombrotus, whose lectures were attended by Menedemus, of whom we shall speak presently. Menippus of Sinope also became renowned amongst them. End of Metrocles Chapter 7. Hipparchia Hipparchia too, sister of Metrocles, was captured by their doctrines. Both of them were born at Maronea. She fell in love with the discourses and the life of Crates, and would not pay attention to any of her suitors, their wealth, their high birth, or their beauty. But to her, Crates was everything. She used to even threaten her parents she would make away with herself, unless she were given in marriage to him. Crates, therefore, was implored by her parents to dissuade the girl, and did all he could. And at last, failing to persuade her, got up, took off his clothes before her face, and said, This is the bridegroom, here are his possessions. Make your choice accordingly, for you will be no helpmeet of mine, unless you share my pursuits. The girl chose, and, adopting the same dress, went about with her husband, and lived with him in public, and went out to dinners with him. Accordingly, she appeared at the banquet given by Lysimachus, and there put down Theodorus, known as the atheist, by means of the following sophism. Any action would not be called wrong if done by Theodorus, would not be called wrong if done by Hipparchia. Now Theodorus does no wrong when he strikes himself, therefore neither does Hipparchia do wrong when she strikes Theodorus. He had no reply wherewith to meet the argument, but tried to strip her off her cloak. 
But Hipparchia showed no sign of alarm or of the perturbation natural in a woman. And when he said to her, Is this she who quitting woof and warp and comb and loom? She replied, It is I, Theodorus, but do you suppose that I have been ill-advised about myself if instead of wasting further time upon the loom I spent it in education? These tales and countless others are told of the female philosopher. There is current a work of Crates entitled Epistles, containing excellent philosophy in a style which sometimes resembles that of Plato. He has also written tragedies, stamped with a very lofty kind of philosophy, as for example the following passage. Not one tower hath my country, nor one roof, but wide as the whole earth its citadel, and home prepared for us to dwell therein. He died in old age and was buried in Boeotia. End of Hipparchia Chapter 8 Menippus Menippus, also a cynic, was by descent a Phoenician, a slave, as Achaicus in his treatise on ethics says. Diocles further informs us that his master was a citizen of Pontus and was named Baton. But as avarice made him very resolute in begging, he succeeded in becoming a Theban. There is no seriousness in him, but his books overflow with laughter, much the same as those of his contemporary Meleager. Hermippus says that he lent out money by day and got a nickname from doing so, for he used to make loans on bottomry and take security, thus accumulating a large fortune. At last, however, he fell victim to a plot, was robbed of all, and in despair ended his days by hanging himself. I have composed a trifle upon him. Maybe you know Menippus, Phoenician by birth, but a Cretan hound, a money lender by day, so he was called, at Thebes when once a time his house was broken into, and he lost his all, not understanding what it is to be a cynic, he hanged himself. Some authorities questioned the genuineness of the books attributed to him, alleging them to be by Dionysius and Zopyrus of Colophon, who, writing them for a joke, made him over to Menippus as a person able to dispose of them advantageously. There have been six men named Menippus, the first man who wrote a history of the Lydians and abridged Xanthus, the second, my present subject, the third, a sophist of Stratonicae, a carrion by descent, the fourth, a sculptor, the fifth and sixth, painters, both mentioned by Apollodorus. However, the writings of Menippus the Cynic are thirteen in number. Necromancy, wills, epistles artificially composed as if by the gods, replies to the physicists and mathematicians and grammarians, and a book about the birth of Epicurus and the school's reverence for the twentieth day, besides other works. End of Menippus Chapter 9 Menademus Menademus was a pupil of Collodes of Lampsacus. According to Hippobotus, he had attained such a degree of audacity and wonder-working that he went about in the guise of a fury, saying that he had come from Hades to take cognizance of sins committed, and was going to return and report them to the powers down below. This was his attire. A great tunic reaching to the feet, about it a crimson girdle, an Arcadian hat on his head with the twelve signs of the zodiac inwrought in it, buskins of tragedy, and he wore a very long beard and carried an ashed staff in his hand. Such are the lives of the several cynics, but we will go on to append the doctrines which they held in common, if, that is, we decide that cynicism is really a philosophy, and not, as some maintain, just a way of life. They are content, then, like Ariston of Chios, to do away with the subjects of logic and physics, and to devote their whole attention to ethics, and what some assert of Socrates, Diocles records of Diogenes, representing him as saying, we must inquire into whatever of good or ill within our halls is wrought. They also dispense with the ordinary subjects of instruction. At least Antisthenes used to say that those who had attained discretion had better not study literature, lest they should be perverted by alien influences. So they got rid of geometry and music and all such studies. Anyhow, when somebody showed Diogenes a clock, he pronounced it a serviceable instrument to save oneself from being late to dinner. Again, to a man who gave a musical recital before him, he said, By men's minds, states are ordered well, and households, not by the lyre's twang strings or flute's trilled notes. They hold further that life according to virtue is the end to be sought, as Antisthenes says in his Heracles, exactly like the Stoics. 
for indeed there is a certain close relationship between the two schools. Hence it has been said that cynicism is a shortcut to virtue, and after the same pattern does Zeno of Kittium live his life. They also hold that we should live frugally, eating food for nourishment only and wearing a single ornament. Wealth and fame and high birth they despise. Some at all events are vegetarians and drink cold water only, and are content with any kind of shelter or tubs, like Diogenes, who used to say that it was the privilege of the gods to need nothing, and of godlike men to want but little. They hold further that virtue can be taught, as Antistony maintains in his Heracles, and when once acquired, cannot be lost. And that the wise man is worthy to be loved, impeccable, and a friend to his like, and that we should entrust nothing to fortune. Whatever is intermediate between virtue and vice, they, in agreement with Ariston of Chios, account indifferent. So much then for the Cynics. We must now pass on to the Stoics, whose founder was Zeno, a disciple of Crates. End of Menedemus End of Book 6 of Lives of the Eminent Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius this translation was published by the Loeb Classical Library, 1925.